Come gather round the campfire and hear our ghostly tales of chilling terrors, darkest woes, and anything that goes bump in the night. So cuddle up with your best friend or dare it alone. The darkness is closing in and spirits are calling your name. This is Fireside Phantoms. I'm going to continue my adventures in Portugal. Oh, good. This time from Porto, a mm. city located north of Lisbon, about three hours from train. Very good. I know nothing about Portugal, so whatever you said, cool. Okay. <laughs> Sit back and relax. This All is right. going to be kind of like a travel journal okay. uh, with a little my, bit of horror. Let me, let me get my umbrella drink ready to okay, go. Okay, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Upon our arrival... Um, our taxi driver enthusiastically tells us how we are so lucky to arrive in time for the big party on the 24th. We all looked at each other wondering, how did he know we're celebrating my daughter's 30th birthday on the 24th? <laughs> That's weird. But he continues by stating that there is a midsummer festival that honors St. John the Baptist, the patron saint of Porto. He tells us the whole city shuts down in the early afternoon of the 23rd and the celebrations continue until 6 a.m. the next morning to mark the beginning of St. John's Day on June 24th. He said there will be dancing and singing and we better be prepared to get a hammer because people will hit you over the head if you don't carry one. <laughs> and mind you, these aren't real hammers, but made of plastic that are super cute and they make noises when you hit someone. I bet you could get away with a real hammer, though. <laughs> I think you could. I, I don't know. Yeah. If people are drunk enough. Yeah. So he also warns us of ladies carrying long stems of garlic or leeks uh -huh. and that they'll playfully attack you on the street. So I'm glad he warned us because if I saw somebody coming at me with a big long strand of garlic or, yeah. you know, a stem like that, I, yeah. I would think the whole city has lost its marbles. <laughs> right. And everyone gathers, I mean everyone, the elderly and babies too, down by the Duro River on both sides. Shops will roll out tables and grills, cooking sardines and pork for their sandwiches, along with plenty of beer stands. Now, he should have warned us about the lack of bathrooms, though, but never mind. Mm -hmm. Our taxi uh. driver also waved his arms around, claiming they have the biggest fireworks display we will ever see at midnight. So mm. we have to stay for those. Mm -hmm. He tells us to be prepared to walk home because no cars or taxi service is available as all the roads will be blocked off until the following morning. And that's probably a good thing considering the whole city is drunk. <laughs> now, normally I don't care about fireworks because of my pets. And we all thought, He's just exaggerating, but he was not. Mm. The festival was outrageously done. They even had colorful paper balloons that everyone gathered around to light and watch float out over the river. Oh, cool. We saw some of these settle into trees, which were a bit alarming, but nothing ever caught fire. And they set fireworks off the bridge, which was amazing. They had this technique where the streaming lights from the fireworks cascaded down off the bridge to look like a gigantic white glistening waterfall. Oh, cool. Very it cool. It was so amazing. Yeah. Of course, my mind was thinking, hope that isn't damaging the Iron Bridge. But they took time afterward to investigate before they opened it back up again for the public to cross over. During the half hour of waiting, though, it can feel very panicky if you don't like being trapped like sardines waiting for death. But we lived. And a word of advice from your fairy godmother. If you go during the festival, make sure you cross back from the Gaia side of the river to the Porto side before the clock strikes midnight or you will be stuck and at the mercy of St. John. Oh, geez. <laughs> so the origins of this festival can be traced back to pagan and pre-Christian traditions that celebrated the summer solstice. Over time, these traditions merged with Christian customs and evolved into the modern festival. The tradition of garlic and hammers and leeks is believed to bring good luck and ward off evil spirits. It was a good thing we purchased our hammers because my head was probably pounded 200 times. <laughs> it was all good fun, though, and I did bop a bunch of people myself. Yeah. I went after the little kids, though, and the grandmas. Yeah. You know, easy target. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Porto has six beautiful bridges that cross the river, and on a boat tour, we learned that the iconic double-deck iron bridge, the Dom Louis, or Dom Louis, has a legend associated with it. According to the legend... 
The River Duro runs beneath the Dom Lewis Bridge and is known as the River of Forgetfulness. It is said that anyone who crosses underneath the bridge will be under the spell of the river, causing them to forget their troubles, worries, and even their most cherished memories. I think it's a sweet story to claim the river's mystical waters have the power to wipe away the burdens of daily life. Like a bridge over troubled water. Maybe that song was about this Maybe. bridge. Visitors and locals nickname it as the Bridge of Forgetfulness. The bridge's stunning architecture and panoramic views of Porto and Gaia, the city's neighboring town, further add to the ethereal atmosphere of this story. The bridge is one of two that resembles the architecture similar to the Eiffel Tower and was designed and built by Theophile Syring, who was a founder of Eiffel and Company with Gustav Eiffel. So it does have a resemblance to the same open iron lattice work of the Eiffel Tower. There's also, though, a much darker tale of the Dura River, as it is a collector of souls and holds the largest number of victims of any other river in the world. Oh, really? Hmm. History's deadliest bridge collapse took place in Portugal when Napoleon in 1809 tried to attack the city of Porto on March 29th. Many citizens tried to flee across the pontoon bridge, the Ponte das Barcas, when it collapsed under the weight of the people. The saddest part is that the crowds who were fleeing kept pushing from further back, not able to see or know that the bridge had collapsed. It is estimated 4,000 Portuguese civilians and French soldiers died in the collapse. There is a further tragedy, though, to the story, that despite the bridge collapse, historians think the river claimed over 6,000 lives because the civilians, with nowhere to cross now that the bridge collapsed, decided to throw themselves into the river knowing they were going to drown. Oh, jeez. They preferred a watery grave to a deadly fate by the French sword or trampled by their horses. Oh, boy. That's pretty bleak. Yeah. With so much death in that river, would you ever want to swim in it? No. No, I would not. Yes, yeah, so that's some freaky stories. Mm -hmm. One of the most well-known legends in Porto is associated with the establishment of the city's name. According to popular lore, the city's name Porto is derived from the Latin word portus, meaning port or harbor. However, an alternate and more colorful theory suggests that the name Porto comes from the Latin Cale Portus, referring to the port of Cale. In this version, Cale was a Greek sailor who boasted of a strange legend. Huh. It was said he slew a fearsome sea monster or a dragon that was terrorizing the region's waters. Oh, really? There be dragons. <laughs> <laughs> as a result, the port where the dragon was defeated came to be known as Porto in honor of the heroic act. And the dragon symbol is seen everywhere in Portugal, making the legend quite powerful. Do they have a, um, a petite white haired woman who rules their village <laughs> and these three monstrous dragons oh, fly behind Are you her talking all the time? about the mother of dragons? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It is found in their coat of arms though. And the Portuguese also named their football team after the dragon and their stadium. It was also claimed that the Christian Saint George, who classically was attributed to fighting dragons, made his way down to Portugal. It is curious that there are medieval maps depicting certain areas of Portugal with symbols of serpents and dragons. Other maps are shown with quotes saying, there be dragons, <laughs> referring to areas of wild terrain and unknowable danger. Yeah. So there you go, Holly. It huh. is definitely the land of dragons. And did you know the spinoff of Game of Thrones, The House of Dragons, mm. was partly filmed in Portugal? Oh, cool. Okay. I did not know that. I haven't watched that yet, but... I haven't either. My husband did. He liked it. Um, of course, I can't talk about Porto and not include some of the stories of wineries, right? Oh, of course not. After all, the region of Duro Valley is home to the best port wine in the world. The Gaia side of the river across from Porto is where you will find the wineries and tours unless you opt for taking a trip out into the Duro Valley countryside. Many of the wineries were connected to a system of caves, which are just deep underground cellars carved into the hillside to store the large barrels of wine. We did take a wine tour at Taylor's and didn't hear any good ghost stories, but we enjoyed the port there and highly recommend it to anyone going. We also went to Calum Wineries and were fortunate enough to have had a good tour guide who knew some great stories. 
The guide spoke of the workers who had to climb into the wine barrels to check the quality or something. Maybe it was just to clean them once they were empty. I don't really remember exactly. Uh, I blame it on the port. You were drunk. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But according to the guide, one of the workers had been down in the cellar a long time alone. And when they went to check on him, they found the poor worker had passed out drunk from the intoxicating fumes in the bottom of the wine barrel. Other legends say the workers found him dead. Afterwards, it was the rule that groups of two or more had to be checking the barrels together. One of them would always be singing who was inside the barrel. And if the other heard a change in their singing or silence, they'd have to go in after them very quickly. Yeah. Now they wear special coverings over their faces and use equipment. So nothing like that would happen again. Of course, if the man actually did die, his ghost is probably still wandering around. There is said to be a particularly old and hidden wine cellar in the region that has a sinister reputation. This cellar is believed to be cursed with a dark and malevolent presence lingering within its depths. According to the legend long ago, a group of workers discovered a hidden passage leading into this mysterious empty cellar. They ventured inside, unaware of the doom that awaited them. As the story goes, the workers never returned from the cellar. It is said that they were consumed by the malevolent spirits that inhabited the darkness, or worse, something else, maybe dragons. Their tormented souls now haunt the depths of the cursed cellar, Hmm. seeking to trap anyone who dares to venture too close. That's creepy. Yes. Workers and visitors that have gone into the depths of the cellar have reported hearing eerie whispers, feeling cold gusts of air, and sense an overwhelming feeling of dread. Over time, the cursed cellar became a forbidden and avoided place within the winery caves. I tried to find out the name and place of this exact winery or the area it is located, but nobody wants it found. Hmm. Suspicious. Very strange. Maybe they blocked it off from the public so no more people disappear down there. Yeah, really (laughs) creepy. There's also a story told of a ghostly guardian that is said to watch over the aging barrels of port wine in the cellars. According to this tale, the ghost is believed to be the spirit of a dedicated winemaker who met a tragic end many years ago. The worker was known for his exceptional dedication to the craft of port wine. He spent countless hours tending to the barrels and ensuring that the wine was properly cared for. However, one night a storm flooded the area, trapping the worker among some of the dislodged barrels, and he was unable to escape, resulting in his untimely death. Mm. Since that tragic incident, it is said that the spirit of the worker continues to watch over the barrels, ensuring that the wine is well tended and cared for. Some workers and visitors claim to have seen a shadowy figure dressed in old-fashioned clothing moving among the barrels, checking their condition. Others have reported hearing faint footsteps or feeling a presence nearby when they are all alone in the cellars. I could not find much proof for any of these tales, but they do add to the fun of exploring the cellar caves and wineries in Porto. Add to the lore of the Mm -hmm. place. Yeah. Mm. At the Quinta da Pacheca estate in Portugal's wine-producing Juro Valley, guests at the vineyard can stay in luxuriously furnished sleeping pods designed to look exactly like gigantic wooden wine barrels. When do we go? I know. It's (laughs) so fun. We didn't know about these when we went. But they do rent for about $250 per night. And I think it would make for such a fun experience if you're already doing tours out there. And you're an alcoholic. That'd be great. <laughs> no no getting back to the city That's from right. there. No way. Most people who visit Porto don't realize there is a connection to drum roll. Mm. Harry Potter. Oh, gosh. <laughs> of course. Fell right for it. One of the best sights we got to see, in my opinion, and fellow Harry Potter fans will agree, was the Libraria Lello. Dating back to the very early 1900s, this bookstore is perhaps one of the most gorgeous in the world. My son-in-law thankfully researched Porto and took us here knowing how much we love all things Harry. (laughs) Supposedly, author J.K. Rawlings lived for a short period of time, two to three years in Porto, working as an English teacher before her divorce and visited the store often. This bookshop is said to have inspired the design of the shop Floor Shambats in Hogwarts and even some of the features at the Library of Hogwarts. Oh, that's cool. It is beautiful. There is an ornate wooden carved center staircase with winding red stairs to a top level floor. Potterheads believe these stairs might have been the inspiration for the moving staircases in Hogwarts. Beautiful wooden shelves of books, ladders to access top shelves, a stained glass ceiling, and of course, 
A studious, moody atmosphere with all sorts of nooks and crannies add to the mystique of the bookshop. It also has a restricted section with rare books. Yay. Mm. And on the upper level, a cafe. I think it is the only bookstore that you have to wait in a long line and pay money to enter. Five euros per person. But it is definitely awe-inspiring, and you can use the money as a credit towards a souvenir book. Hmm, cool. That's yeah. cool. A lot of fans yeah. waiting to get in there. I bet. I bet it. It's very popular. Yes, and the Harry um, tour is continuing, so pay oh, attention. okay. Just a short gallop along the cobblestone streets from <laughs> Libraria Lello, a picturesque pathway takes you back in time as you come across a little broom emporium. The Escovaria de Belomonte. It is the genuine deal straight out of Diagon Alley's renowned broomstick and quality Quidditch supplies. Hmm, very nice. Yes, an intimate family-run establishment that takes immense pride in crafting the most exquisite brooms suitable for both muggles, wizards, and homes alike. In an interview with J.K. Rowling, she claimed she penciled out a rough draft of the Philosopher's Stone while she spent her time in Porto. Hmm. Other conversations say she wrote notes on paper napkins outlining all her books before she moved to Edinburgh. Mm -hmm. Rowling also confirmed that Salazar Slytherin, founder of Slytherin House and one of the four founders of Hogwarts, was inspired from the Portuguese dictator's name, Antonio de Oliveira Salazar who kept his rule for 40 years over Porto from 1932 to 1968. Even down to the Hogwarts student uniforms can be linked to Porto school uniforms, which include a black cape, hood, and a smart outfit of tie and skirt. The only thing missing is the bright colors to distinguish the house colors. You can visit the Atoga shop on Rua de Fernandez Tomas in Porto. They sell all kinds of student robes if you're interested. Oh, that's kind of neat. Yeah. It is cool. Yeah. Now, Rowling's ex-husband also said they would often go to the Majestic Cafe in Porto, a swanky place with servers dressed to the nines, wearing white gloves, chandeliers overhead, linen napkins, and a piano bar. The cafe was opened in 1921 and catered to writers, intellectuals, and politicians for its beautiful atmosphere. We all have some questions, though, because how do you write your notes on a linen napkin? Sean Smith, in his biography of the author, claimed she would write her notes on napkins here while sipping coffee. Maybe the cafe had paper ones back when she was there. It was generally known that Rowling was struggling financially, so if there were some visits here, it truly might have been just for coffee. We didn't dine there. Super crowded, long lines, overpriced food. And the family was on the hunt for Francisina's. The very, very scary but traditional dish of Porto. Hmm. It is a heart attack on a plate oh, that truly most Americans will love. <sighs> it is a sandwich made with bread, the thicker the better, ham, or it can be made with Portuguese sausage, steak, or roast beef. Then they top it all off with a mountain of melted cheese and serve it swimming in a special tomato and beer sauce. Oh my gosh. Most wow. of the times, it's also served with a fried egg on top. Yeah, of course. It, of course. And also a side of French fries mm -hmm. for dipping in the sauce. Sure. That does sound like a Can hard you believe attack that? waiting to happen. Oh, it's so bad. So bad. We were lucky that the place we found had a veggie version for meat made with portobello mushrooms instead of meat. That's good. I still thought, though, my heart would not make it back to the hotel. <laughs> I mean, Porto is very hilly. Yeah. Steep hills. Yeah. Um, and the Portuguese, I think they're serving up death all in the right way. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty funny. They got it down quite right. Yeah, they do. The dish is just downright evil in my mind. So if you're going to order one of those, mind you, you only need one to split between two people. Nice. <laughs> but speaking of evil and glorious chandeliers, you can visit the most beautiful McDonald's in the world right in Porto. It has a huge eagle crowning the entrance, stained glass windows, sculptures, chandeliers, and gorgeous furnishings. But I digress. Back to the ghost <laughs> stories. <laughs> Porto has one of the most stunning train stations at the Sao Bento, mm. meaning St. Benedict. Mm -hmm. It features an amazing 20,000 hand-painted Azulejo tiles. They're oh. like blue, blue tiles yeah. covering the history of Porto and is considered a must-see when visiting. Mm -hmm. But many people don't know the story of it being haunted. Oh. Back in the day, way back in the late 1800s, mm -hmm. the spot where Sao Bento Station now resides was home to the Benedictine nuns of Ave Maria. Now, in 1821, this convent had a total of 55 nuns and 105 staff members. 
mainly personal maids. I bet that helped convince single ladies to sign up. Mm -hmm. Your own personal maid service for life. Yeah. On further research, I found that this particular convent only accepted women of a high social status, namely from noble families. So I think it was a way. They want their money. Yeah, it was a way for them to give up their lives Mm -hmm. and say, look, if we provide you a personal maid, will you be a nun? (laughs) (laughs) Sounds like a good deal to me. Now, here comes the nightmare fuel. Okay. In 1834, a man by the name of Joachim Antonio de Aguiar, a.k.a. the Monk's Grim Reaper, Mm -hmm. issued a decree that pretty much shut down all religious orders in Portugal, Mm -hmm. confiscating their properties once they left. Mm Mm-hmm. No more monks, no more nuns, kaput. None of the orders could allow any new members. And even the convent of the Benedictine nuns of Ave Maria wasn't spared. Hmm. They were already struggling financially, and after the formal decree, they had to ditch their fancy silverware in a public square just to make ends meet. Mm -hmm. The place started crumbling, and without proper upkeep, the neglect and lack of financial support also started to affect the health of the nuns. But the nuns were determined to stay and refused to give up on the property. One by one, the nuns started to die off. Hmm. On May 1892, the last nun finally died, a whopping 58 years after the whole religious order apocalypse. It was said that she was very stubborn and determined to outlive the monk's reaper, which she did by a long shot. The monk's grim reaper died in May of 1884. So demolition of the convent began immediately. Legend has it that the ghost of that last abbess still hangs around Sao Bento Station, doing her eerie rounds in a way that'll send shivers down your spine. It is a rare occasion when the station is quiet enough, but some claim to hear whispers and chants of her prayers echoing in the air. There was some trouble, too, with the construction of the station. The railway line was constructed and first opened four years later, and the first train to arrive had no station as the building was off schedule for completion and over budget. Well, that sounds like the Denver (laughs) airport history, doesn't it? Yeah, it it does. (laughs) (laughs) So the tile work was the main holdup, taking 11 years for one man to complete as they were all painted by hand, all of those 20,000 tiles. Oh my gosh, wow. They should have hired some more help. Yeah, I guess Not, so. It's yeah. a lot of work for one person. It is. Not until October 1996 was the station open to the public. Hmm. A euphoric crowd finally eager to see the station on the opening day. Did the architect then realize he forgot to build a ticket counter office and a waiting area for the passengers? <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> left, that's a big... Left something out. That's a big problem. <laughs> that's a bit of a problem for sure. But... At least they did a good thing, and they named the station after St. Benedict, Mm -hmm. or I would think they would have bigger paranormal issues on their hands. (laughs) Whenever you say St. Benedict, it always makes me think of Eggs Benedict. I know. (laughs) (laughs) Or Benedict Arnold. Or Benedict Arnold, yeah. Yeah. Now, the Clarigos Tower is a Baroque bell tower that stands adjacent to the Clarigos Church in Porto. Built in the 18th century, it offers a panoramic view of the city from its viewing platform. The legend tells the story of a monk who was involved in a forbidden love affair and was imprisoned in the tower as punishment for life. This phantom monk holds an element of mystery to the iconic landmark. Visitors have reported experiencing a sense of unease while climbing the narrow 450-step spiral staircase, and some have claimed to have glimpsed the shadowy figure of a monk ascending the stairs ahead of them or watching them from a window. Mm. 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 Creepy. Now, we did not have time to go here, but Porto has some very cool cemeteries. The Cemeterio de Agramonte and their guided tour is praised to be very interesting and creepy. The cemetery was hastily opened in 1855 to serve as a burial place for victims of a cholera epidemic. It was the second public cemetery in Porto. Unlike modern cemeteries where we bury our dead in the ground, this cemetery wants the viewer to be up close and personal with the departed. (laughs) The first thing you notice is it is laid out like a small city of the dead. There are long rows on streets of freestanding above ground tombs that resemble many homes, each with a number like your address. Weird. Yes. Most have wrought iron with glass doors so you can see inside where the family caskets are displayed. Why? Okay. 
One blogger claimed he could detect a filing cabinet inside the mausoleum. <laughs> So I the think, dead can look through their files yeah. when they're up at night. I think it's super funny, like trying to take your family secrets with you. Or maybe he truly did love his job. Well, maybe. That's I weird. don't know. I think that's funny. Mm. One of Porto's most famous legends is that of Pedro Cimeterios. According to the story, Pedro was a grave digger who lived during the 19th century. He was known for his odd behavior and eerie connection to the dead. It is said that Pedro could communicate with spirits and had an uncanny ability to predict the deaths of those in the city. Huh. Because he was around death so much, it became a sixth sense to smell the signs of inner rotting. Ew. Yuck. So now it's so gross. You would not want Pedro to come and hunt you out for conversation <laughs> because that meant that might mean you were next to die, right? right? Especially if he was wiggling his nose. Yeah. Or asking to blow his nose <laughs> after so gross. <laughs> It was also rumored that he could have conversations with the spirits of those who had crossed over and souls who were half out of their body wanting to die. Oh, wow. Pretty soon, his eerie reputation grew and people began to fear and shun him. Yeah, I bet. I think he was chill, though, with his social life. After all, he had the whole graveyard of souls to party with. Yeah, yeah. He probably was just saying, no worries. I'll catch you later. <laughs> Once you cross my cemetery gate. That's right. <laughs> And that's all for my stories from Porto. Well, that was great. Yeah, that was very good. Hope you listeners get a chance to go. There's a lot of fun yeah, to be had. Yeah, sounds like it. And hope you like sardines and codfish. Because <laughs> you're going to get plenty of it fed and to you. no vegetables because there's none around. Oh, man. <laughs> well, it sounds like a fun paranormal trip, though. It's fun. Yeah. yeah. That's pretty cool. What do you have for us today? Well, today I am going to cover the Iroquois theater tragedy. Oh, I don't know this one. I didn't either. Um, I kind of came across it and I'm like, oh, it's kind of, kind of interesting. Um, but yeah, it's a pretty, it's a pretty tragic story. Let's just put it that way. At the turn of the century, showbiz was buzzing throughout the cities of America via their theaters where actors and actresses could put on entertaining shows, musicals, comedy routines, and the like. Audiences would flock to these venues for some much needed downtime and maybe a good laugh or two or to have their hearts moved in some way. However, the theaters in the United States were a bit problematic because the buildings contained hot lights, poor electrical wiring, antiquated pulley systems, flammable props and backdrops, and poorly circulated buildings, which when combined could be the perfect storm to cause fires to break out. According to the Encyclopedia of Chicago, quote, theaters had been burning down throughout the 19th century only to be rebuilt and then burned down again, end quote. <laughs> oh, Thus, theaters developed a bit of a reputation for being a fun and entertaining experience, but also one that could be life-threatening if you happen to be there on the night of a big fire. This is where our story begins. In 1903, the Iroquois Theater in Chicago, Illinois, set the grandest stage of all with what is known as the Great Iroquois Theater Fire. The theater was built in downtown Chicago at a neck-breaking pace. The owners wanted it built near the shopping district to attract females to the show. They also wanted to open it before the holiday season to attract as many patrons as possible, you know, thinking that if they open it in the dead winter of Chicago, Illinois, in January and February, no one's going to come out through the snow and the oh. wind to go to a show. Yeah, that's So they're like, <laughs> yeah, they wanted to capture the holiday uh, crowds and get them in there to make some money. So the demand to open by November of 1903 had everyone in a mad push to get things done very fast. Unfortunately, this meant a lot of fire safety measures were simply passed over or ignored in order to make their deadline. When the theater did indeed open in November of 1903, it had a seating capacity of 1,602 people with three levels of seating. The main floor was the orchestra level with 700 seats. The second level was the dress circle level with 400 seats. And the third level was the gallery with 500 seats. There were also six boxes on the sides of the theater. There was only one entrance for the public to enter the theater. The exterior doors pushed in towards the foyer. The foyer led to the orchestra section of seating, but also contained a grand staircase that led up to the dress circle and gallery levels above. 
So, of course, only having just one staircase was against fire code, which indicated each upper level should have its own stairway and exit. The design of the theater turned out to be nightmarish, as upon completion of a show, the audience would be bottlenecked together as the gallery people on the top level had to merge with the dress circle people on the second level, whom had to wait for the orchestra level on the bottom level to file out of the theater before they could exit themselves. Oh, no. Regardless of its design flaws, the Iroquois Theater was considered to be a grand palace in its day, and its advertisements promised a completely fireproof theater. Mm. A magazine called, get this, Fireproof Magazine. Oh, no. Promises, <laughs> promises. Right? Not good. Right. What, what are you telling me? The magazine itself fire? caught on fire? No. Oh. I'm just saying that they actually had a magazine called Fireproof no, Magazine, which and is I, weird. No, and I thought that'd be funny if like it, people are trying to set the magazine on, on fire. fire. I know. <laughs> but it had toured the Iroquois Theater, the, the writer, and said that, quote, the absence of an intake or stage draft shaft the exposed reinforcement of the arch and the presence of wood trim on everything and the inadequate provision of exits, end quote, were problematic for the theater. Patrick Jennings, a captain at the Chicago Fire Department, said there were no sprinklers, alarms, telephones, or water connections at the theater. The theater's employed fireman, William Sollers, discussed the issues with Captain Jennings, but did not raise the concerns with the theater owners as he, he was in fear of losing his job for doing so. In addition to these issues, the builders of the theater were quite proud of the fire curtain they installed. In case a fire did break out, the stage manager could drop the fire curtain between the stage and the audience, and that would contain the fire from spreading, thus keep everyone safe. This fire curtain was why they felt confident they could advertise the Iroquois as a fireproof theater. However, on later review, it was found that the fire curtain was made of asbestos and oh. wood pulp. Yeah, and they obviously <laughs> didn't care about the actors. Let's protect the audience, right. but right. you actors, oh well, well. The audience paid to be there. Yeah, so. um, that's true. So that's money. <laughs> um, so this fire uh, curtain was actually made of asbestos and wood pulp, so it would have been utterly useless in a fire. <laughs> As this tinderbox that was the Iroquois Theater was built, all they had to do was invite in their audience and strike a match. On December 30th, 1903, that match was struck when a matinee production named Mr. Bluebeard began. It starred Eddie Foy and Dan McAvoy. It was a children's comedy about a man who murders his wives and places their bodies on meat hooks in his closet. <laughs> what a wonderful comedy. <laughs> For children. The comedy part was that Mr. Bluebeard's current wife was wise to her fate, and the story followed her attempts to escape Bluebeard's murderous intentions. This was considered a children's play, which was pretty funny that they would advertise that to kids, but not so funny as many children were in, in attendance that day. The play was sold out, and instead of stopping when their ticket sales met seat capacity, the theater owners kept selling more tickets, which meant people could sit and stand in the aisleways or in the back of the theater blocking the exits. Uh -oh. It was estimated that some 2,200 people were in attendance that day in a theater built for 1,600. Just after the second act began, one of the spotlight operators turned a blue spotlight onto the men and women sitting on stage. It was supposed to be a nighttime scene in which they sang the song in the pale moonlight. However, when the spotlight turned on, it caused some hot sparks to fly, possibly a short circuit, and they flew onto a sheer curtain and a small flame erupted. The spotlight operator tried to beat it out with his hand, but the flame flew very quickly up the curtain. The theater's firemen tried to put it out, but unfortunately, the fire spread quickly and went high above the stage, reaching the highly flammable painted canvas of the scenery. This prompted the stage manager to lower their special, quote, fire curtain, end quote, but when they lowered it, it became snagged on a protruding light reflector, and they couldn't get it to drop down. As the audience saw what was happening... They slowly rose to their feet and started heading towards the exits. Foy came out onto the stage and told everyone to stay calm, that the fire curtain would help to protect them, and they would have it down any minute. He continued to calm the crowd as large chunks of the play's backdrops came fluttering down in flames around him. Many of the patrons became more excited and started pushing to get out of the theater. However, due to the exits designed for the theater and the overcrowding that day, they were met with some major bottlenecks. Some members of the crowd found fire exits behind the drapes on the north side of the theater and tried to open the doors, 
only to find that they had been deadlocked to stop non-paying people from sneaking in from the outside. A few of them were able to force open the doors and get out. Meanwhile, the performers also needed to evacuate. They had an exit in the back of the theater, which opened up onto an alleyway. The performers opened the large set of stock double doors that were used to move large set pieces in and out of the theater. However, when they opened these doors to get out, a large gust of icy wind rushed into the theater, creating a backdraft for the Um. fire. The wind gust flew under the half-lowered fire curtain, hit the flames on the stage, and created a huge fireball that exploded up into the upper levels of the theater. Suddenly, the entire place was engulfed in flames, and people were drowning in smoke, screams, and being burned alive. Oh, my gosh. This, and there was a lot of children there, yes, too. Yes, there was. This created a massive panic in the theater, and people started running for their lives. Bodies were falling from the upper levels onto the orchestra section below, blocking the way for the people still trying to escape. People started to pile on top of each other, crush and trample each other in sheer desperation. On the upper levels, those who had escaped the fireball found their way out to the fire escapes. However, in the blackened smoke, they had little to no visibility. And when they stepped out onto the fire escapes, discovered, to their horror, there were no fire escapes. and instead fell six stories to their deaths into the alley in the back of the theater. Because they rushed to get the theater done. They hadn't finished the fire escapes. Mm -hmm. Horrible. Others who were lucky enough to find an actual fire escape gathered out onto the rickety terrace and then either fell or jumped, falling onto the other dead bodies heaped in a pile below. Across from the theater was a building belonging to the Northwestern University campus. Some of the students from Northwestern laid a ladder from their building to the fire escapes at the theater, trying to get people to crawl across. A few people made it, but not everyone did who tried. People trying to exit through the main lobby found the doors open to the inside and not the outside of the theater, causing another logjam for a quick escape. As the theater had no fire alarm or telephone, there was no way to contact the fire department about the fire, so a stagehand was able to get out and run to the nearest firehouse to alert them to what was happening. When the firemen got to the scene, it was too late as the fire had done damage. The firemen concentrated on getting the remaining people off the fire escapes. When they entered the building, it was devastating. They found bodies piled on top of each other, stacked as high as 10 feet tall. Everyone had died either from smoke inhalation or being crushed to death or by the fire itself. The estimation of the number of dead was 575 people, with at least 30 more dying of their injuries over the following weeks. The death toll reached 605 people. 120 of them had fallen to their deaths in the alley. This was a huge tragedy when, in comparison, the Great Chicago Fire of 1871 only killed 300 people. Right. So this is double that. It's so sad. The Iroquois Theater had only been open for six weeks. So it was kind of like the Titanic, you know, it was almost like it's maiden voyage Mm -hmm. and it just, no one panicked at first, but then all of a sudden it started to do the math and go, wait a minute, this is not good. It's like egos, like building up, building it up to be better than it really is. Right. For sure. Of the 300 cast and crew there that day, only five people perished. One of them was an aerialist named Nellie Reed, who was supposed to fly over the audience in a high wire act and drop flowers on them. Nellie had been trapped above the stage when the fire broke out, awaiting her scene. She fell during the fire and three days later died from her injuries and her burns. Of course, the sheer size of the tragedy caused major reform in theater safety across the United States. Serious reviews and retrofitting orders from the government caused theaters all over the country to shut down and review their buildings for fire safety. Building and fire codes became much more revered by builders, and theater owners no longer sold standing room only tickets. One problem discovered at the Iroquois Theater was that the audience could not see where the exits were. The theater owners didn't want exit signs to be marked and lit as they would be distracting during the performances. So the new rules stated that the exits had to be clearly marked and lit for people to see. So that's why when you're in a movie theater, you know, they Mm -hmm. always have the exit sign lit up. That's where that comes from. Another rule was the doors must open from the inside to the outside to ease the flow of people exiting the building, which is another reason you go into a public building, you Mm -hmm. open the door towards you. And when you exit, you push it because it's trying to allow people out at a fast rate if there's a fire. 
Um, fire alarms and sprinkler systems must be in all theaters and real fire curtains must be installed, not highly flammable ones. <laughs> <laughs> or asbestos cancer causing uh, That's one. right. Mm-hmm. Of course, after the fire was all over, it came out that many of the fire inspectors had been bribed to look the other way in enforcing their fire regulations so that the theater could open on time. The firemen were charged with crimes of negligence, but ultimately the charges were dismissed and no one went to prison, with the exception of a man caught taking jewelry and money off the bodies of the deceased that had piled up in the back alleyway, now known as Death Alley. After the tragedy, a new music hall was built with the remaining structure of the Iroquois. And in 1925, the whole building was demolished and the Oriental Theater was constructed. In 2019, the Oriental Theater was renamed the Nederlander Theater. So with a history like this one, there is no doubt that the Iroquois slash Oriental slash Nederlander Theater is very haunted. Actress Anna Geister of Saturday Night Live fame worked in what is now Nederlander Theater when she was cast to play Elphaba and the musical production of Wicked. She Hmm. told Celebrity Ghost Stories that at the end of Act One, her character gets pulled up high above the stage. When this happened, Anna said she was able to see people in groups up in the wings. They should not have been anybody up there. Once she was done with her scene and moving through the labyrinth-like hallways of the theater, she said she heard a child giggling. When she turned the corner, she saw a woman standing there with two young kids dressed in period clothing. She just assumed that they were actors, so she nodded at them as she walked past them. But she got a very strong sense of sadness. The woman just quietly nodded back. After Anna turned the corner, she turned to look back at them and they were gone. She thought that was rather strange. So when she got back to her dressing room, she told her dresser what she had seen. Anna asked her if there were just random actors around backstage. And the dresser said, oh, no, those were probably the people from the fire that you were seeing. They were coming up on the anniversary of the fire, Mm -hmm. which is when the spirits were the most noticed around the theater. So she told Anna, no, those are just ghosts. (laughs) We see them all the time. We see them all the time. Um, Those who have worked in the theater over the years say they have seen people sitting in the balconies even when there was no one there. They have seen apparitions of people on the back stairs in the balconies Mm -hmm. and wearing turn of the last century clothing and plunging to their deaths in the theater. Others have seen phantom flames bursting out the back of the theater and can smell smoke in the air. Photos taken of the theater just after the fire show blobs of light that people think are the souls of those who perished during the fire. Nellie Reed is also seen wearing the burned tutu she had on the night of the fire. A young girl can be heard giggling and flushing toilets backstage. Shadow figures are seen dashing towards the area where the exits would have been in 1903. In Death Alley, the alleyway behind the theater where so many people fell to their deaths, many pictures capture strange anomalies, especially where the walls are charred black. Some psychics won't even walk down the alleyway because the energy is just too overwhelming. I bet. The, the eighth floor of a neighboring building was used as a triage unit and morgue for victims of the fire. That building has been a Macy's department store since 2006, with many of the employees having strange experiences in the employee locker room, which is located, you guessed it, on the eighth floor. Uh-huh. <laughs> the Iroquois Theater fire remains the single deadliest single building fire in terms of loss of life in American history and the single deadliest theater fire in the world. Yeah, I had never heard that story. I mean, I do associate Chicago with fires in general. Yes, like you always hear about that great, ones. great fire, yeah. Chicago fire. Um, but yeah, so that one was pretty bad. So anyway, <laughs> sorry to bum you guys all out. But that's, uh... <laughs> you know, speaking of fire, I just was watching a little ad on Instagram. They're not paying me to say this. Oh, but okay. It just brought my attention that the number one start of fires is in your kitchen. Oh, uh, really? Kitchen fires. Kitchen and most fires. people don't realize that water won't um, ex- extinguish the flame because it's grease usually oh. um, that sets it off. And so, so what they're like saying a fire is fire extinguisher. you need a sm- something to smother it, which they say they sell these like blankets where you can just throw it on the fu- on the flame and oh. it puts it out really quickly. Oh, okay. Or yeah, you need a type of fire extinguisher that is specially made for kitchen fires. And so so hopefully that's a helpful terror tip. Yeah, that's a good terror for tip. everyone. Yeah, that's not a bad idea to have something like that in your kitchen. I mean, especially if you cook a lot. Yeah, because it's so easy to you know yeah. get out of control with the yeah. with the grease or whatever. Yes, so. yes, for sure. So every hear that everybody stay safe in your fire and your fire in your kitchen. <laughs> in your kitchen. If there's a fire. <laughs> Thanks, Carol, for the tip. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs>
It is said they were consumed by the mala- beautiful wooden shelves of books and ladders were our <clears throat> beautiful wooden shelves of books and wooden ladders are across the book. Sh- How, why did I write this? <laughs> the cemetery was hastily opened in 1855 to serve as a burial place for victims of a cholera, a cholera epidemic. Co- cholera. cholera. <laughs> One more time. However, when the spotlight turned on, it caused some hot sparks to fly, possibly a short circuit, and they flew into... Um, blah, blah, blah. The eighth floor of a neighboring building was used as a triage... Oh, my God. I'm so close. Triage. So close to the end. As the flames die down, do remain undaunted. Though all hitchhikers are ghosts and all dolls are definitely haunted. Hey guys, be sure to follow us on Instagram. Our handle is at Fireside Phantoms. If you have a spooky story you would like to share with us, send it to firesidephantoms at gmail.com and you may hear it on a future episode. <laughs>